and professor in the Department of Political Science here at Emory. And we're delighted to be hosting this event with the Carter Center of China Focus and the China Research Center of Atlanta, which is a virtual research center in the greater Atlanta area affiliated with the Ivan Allen College at Georgia Tech. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Che Shingo, who is professor at the School of International Studies at Peking University and the Ping Distinguished Fellow at Stanford University's Institute for International Studies. A leading political scientist from the People's Republic of China, Professor Chai received his PhD in political science from Cornell University. Uh, throughout his distinguished career, he has published extensively on US-China relations and Chinese foreign policy. In his talk today, Professor Chai yeah. will speak about the past, present, and future of US-China relations. Oh God, how many times can we hear? There will be a moderated discussion with oh, my Professor Holly Sametko, also in the political science department, and Dr. Penelope Prime from the China Research Center of Atlanta, and Professor Philip Bailey Wang of Georgia Tech will serve as discussants. At the end of the session, all are invited to a reception in the Atwood lobby. So again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, presentation. We have to get it. Everybody has on their yeah. arms. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Recording in progress. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rich, and uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Professor Liu uh, Liang for uh, to help me to get here. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the thin uh, college of Beta. We're just trying to set it up for you. No, why was it? Okay, I just shut myself up. <laughs> okay, uh, now we're going to talk about a very important topic today, uh, uh, about China-U.S. relations. Um, I think for the past probably six or seven years, all things have happened to this relationship has been going down and down uh, from bad to worse. Okay. And uh, this is not a trivial event because what we are talking about are two huge countries with uh, a lot of uh, capabilities, including military capabilities. And we are facing a situation in which the two countries may fight a war by accident, if not by design. So uh, today we'll talk about how this relationship, uh, how, how should we assess the current state of the relationship? And how, uh, why, you know, the relationship has developed to such kind of situation? And what's the prospect? the future development of this relationship. Actually, uh, the relationship began to take a deep dip uh, during the Trump administration. Before that, uh, you know, we had problems between the two countries. Uh, but mainly, uh, uh, 
at least the leaders of the two countries thought. Probably uh, other experts and uh, uh, you know uh, scholars uh, also shared the view that um, the two countries shared more things in common than uh, the differences. So we should try to manage our differences and uh, try to work together on areas of shared interest. And both are stakeholders of the existing international system. So uh, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, we had a lot of conflicts, but then things were looked at from that perspective. But then Trump came in. Uh, the situation uh, with the Russian church. Of course, it's not all Trump's fault. <laughs> but uh, Trump, during the Trump period, uh, we saw this uh, the drastic change. At that time, a lot of people uh, began to ask the question. Uh, are we in a state uh, in a cold war or not? My answer uh, was that uh, we are not uh, definitely <laughs> no. Why? Because in history we only had one cold war. That's the cold war between U.S. and the U.S.S.R. And that cold war had three prominent features. The first is ideological competition. The second is uh, uh, military confrontation. The third is economic isolation. In terms of uh, ideological competition, uh, the USSR uh, tried to promote proletarian uh, revolution uh, and tried to build something like uh, communism. We still don't know what that, that is uh, in the final analysis, but that's the ideal, okay. including something like abolition of private property. The US was promoting liberal democracy. Uh, so we saw two competing ideologies at a global level, sponsored by uh, two uh, major countries, USSR and the USA. The second prominent feature, military confrontation. The US and USSR uh, were competing uh, all over the world uh, for strategic advantage. Uh, they supported uh, the uh, Puppet regimes to fight each other. And they were deploying uh, their troops uh, in a, 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 and maneuvers uh, from a strategic perspective. So there was this global military rivalry. And in terms of uh, economic relationship, the two economies, the USSR economy and, and the Europe, the U.S. economy was separate, okay. uh, and they forged two different blocks: uh, uh, Comic Con on the U.S. Uh, uh, Soviet side, and uh, World Bank, IMF, you know, uh, and the uh, GATT uh, on the U.S. side. Okay. So the world's economy was di was divided into two as well. If we measure China-US relationship uh, with these three features as indicators, we find that China and US are far away from the Cold War, at least at the time. Uh, in the ideological terms, China and US were not competing. Even today, <laughs> I think the competition is uh, uh, a very artificially construct, construct construct. Why? Because China has never advocated 
at least in recent years, an ideology that will compete, that will rival with the US, uh, with that of the US, like liberal democracy. China has claimed it has tried to develop a path of development called socialism with Chinese characteristics. And China has been arguing that this is the way that China has found for China in the light of Chinese national conditions. So basically, it's unique for China. It's not supposed to be replicated overseas. So in the 19th Party Congress report delivered by Xi Jinping, basically he argued that other developing countries do not necessarily have to follow the Western model. Uh, they, 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 they can develop their own model just like China according to their own national conditions. Here, China is not offering its model for other countries to copy. Rather, this, it says that you don't necessarily have to follow the Western model. You can follow your own model right, for development. So there is no such thing as ideological competition as the one between the Soviet Union and the US during the Cold War years. And in terms of military confrontation, sure, China and US had some military skirmishes, uh, maneuvers in the South China Sea, and perhaps also in the Taiwan Strait nowadays. But these are, you know, uh, military skirmishes and, and conflicts. Uh, and we took great care not to get too close to each other and to get into an accidental war. So, uh, uh, China and the US are not competing on a global scale in a strategic sense. Uh, of course, some in the US government, uh, especially. Uh, uh, in, in Pentagon or, or maybe CIA, they, they, they may be thinking that China is planning on, is competing with the US on a global scale in, mili in a military sense. But uh, generally speaking, I think China is not doing that. Mostly, China's concerned with uh, the South China Sea issues and the Taiwan uh, Strait. So we don't have a similar situation uh, as a uh, military confrontation between the US, uh, Soviet Union, and the US during the Cold War years. And economically speaking, China and US economies are so closely intertwined. Uh, it's a stark contrast uh, with the situation between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. So if you add all the, the, the three up, uh, you draw the conclusion that. Uh, the two countries are far from a state of Cold War. But a lot of things have happened over the years, uh, since uh, over the past few years, <laughs> very rapid. Uh, we begin to see some changes uh, that indicate that our relationship is moving toward Cold War very rapidly. Ideologically speaking, both China and the United States are, you know, emphasizing the ideological differences in the two countries now. For the Biden administration, it has been uh, portraying this uh, competition uh, between the so-called authoritarianism and democracy, right? That's between China and the U.S. Uh, uh, and in China, uh, the Chinese government has been saying that uh, we, we, you know, we are, you know, uh, striving for uh, Marx uh, under the banner of Marxism uh, to fight and resist uh, the, the imperialist pressures from the U.S. So this is a, a situation that both in which both countries are emphasizing uh, ideology uh, in the relationship. 
Um, this is pretty bad. <laughs> Why? Because if the relationship is about interest, then we can always bargain, negotiating, and compromising. It's a matter of uh, who gets a bit uh, advantage over what. Yeah. But if it is about ideology, it's about identity. It's not about bargaining. So uh, it's about right and wrong, about good and evil. And so it's, it's something about, you know, you, you, don't, you don't give an inch. Then the relationship becomes very difficult to manage um, in a practical way. So this is one development. Another development is, uh, I think, as the tension in China and the US militaries, uh, in the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait grew uh, uh, larger. Uh, I think uh, US, incre US military increasingly regard China as a strategic challenge. And China, of course, regards the US as the main rival. So we are spending a lot of money to uh, uh, face each other's challenge with, I mean, to the militaries on both sides, it's never enough. So uh, we are, I think we are on the verge of engaging in the military comp competition, arms competition. And, and finally, e economy. In economic terms, um, the relationship is also moving in a negative direction because the, uh, for various reasons, the Biden administration has not, has find it difficult to give up with the uh, tariffs uh, the Trump administration imposed on China. Why? <laughs> because uh, of domestic uh, perceived domestic uh, obstacles. I don't think the Biden administration people believe that such tariffs are necessary and are good for the U.S. interest. Because uh, among other things, it has kept the U.S. Uh, the, the price of consumer goods up. Right? Uh, in addition to that, so in order to contain China, the Biden administration has seen the necessity of, of uh, uh, you know, containing and bashing Chinese technologies. So basically slow down China's uh, technological development. So you have this, the sanctions against Huawei and other high-tech companies in China. Uh, and also uh, using the long leg uh, uh, sanctions uh, targeting at companies with, of other countries which uh, trade with these uh, Chinese high tech firms. And of course, on the Chinese side, uh, in order to make sure that it's not, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, in China, Chinese will say cut, cut road technologies <laughs> uh, are uh, monopolized by the US and may be used against China. Uh, so China has been spending uh, on a, you know, uh, in a huge way uh, to develop its own indigenous technologies to replace the US uh, that perceived uh, you know, cut road technologies. So economic decoupling and also, uh, also the, uh, uh, the Biden people, and, and of course, uh, especially in the US Congress, a lot of people are talking about uh, the, the risks of supply chains. So basically they say that the US should not be dependent on China on this uh, product or on that product because this would hurt the US economy. Dependency is a risk. 
And in China, we have this people who make the same kind of argument. So as a result, even though the economic relationship is still intense between the two countries, the trend of decoupling, both in economic terms and also in technological terms, is taking place. Um, so this is the situation uh, we are facing. Uh, we are not in a cold war, but we are far. We are rapidly approaching to that uh, situation. Why has the relationship reached to such kind of state? I think at least four, five factors are explaining uh, can help us to explain it. Explain it. First is the view of lucidity strategy. Uh, the second is difference between political systems and values. The third is the role of Donald Trump. The fourth is domestic politics. The fifth is negative interactions. Uh, lucidity strategy uh, means the claim that the relationship between the rising power and the established power inevitably ends up in confrontation and war as a result of the change in balance of power and psychological fear on the part of the right, uh, the established power. Um, Professor Graham Addison of Harvard University uh, first came up with a concept. Uh, it's an old story, but he came up with this concept and became very popular. Uh, uh, for, for policymakers and also for people on the street. So basically, uh, uh, if you follow the logic, uh, then China and the US have to fight a war, uh, or at least the Cold War. There's no way out of it because China is the rising power and the US is the, is the established one. Uh, because a lot of people in, on both sides subscribe to this kind of argument, uh, uh, it has a big impact on policies of both countries. It's really unfortunate. Uh, but it's a, a reality. As China rises further, I think this, the influence of this kind of argument becomes uh, greater. So uh, if you subscribe to this kind of argument, whatever the other side does is part of this uh, grand strategy to uh, uh, prepare for the ultimate showdown uh, with you. So uh, China came up with this Belt and Road Initiative and people here would explain this. This is China's grand geopolitical planning, uh, geoeconomic and geopolitical planning uh, 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 around the globe, uh, trying to oust the US influence and prepare for eventual uh, uh, you know, showdown between China and the US. And also China's uh, uh, assertion on the South China, in, in South China Sea over the disputed Territories and, 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 and maritime interests. It's also perceived as the first, you know, uh, uh, signs of China's, uh, you know, geopolitical expansion uh, outward uh, to the rest of the world as a result of the rise of China. Um, so, U.S. according to this argument. Uh, Side of thinking it has to get prepared and, and, and try to contain China. And on the Chinese side, we see efforts on the part of the US to, to contain China in the South China Sea, in Taiwan, and in other areas. So, all whatever China, whatever the US does, is perceived as a way to, to contain China and to prepare for this eventual showdown between the two countries. The people who share this view, they interact with each other. 
they confer they, they they use their actions and rhetoric to confirm to to uh, help the other side to to reconfirm their views. So this is a situation where we are in. The second uh, factor that has influenced China-U.S. relations uh, in a significant way is the difference in political system and values. China has a different uh, political system and, and values uh, from the U.S. Uh, uh, that has been the, the case for many, many years. But in the old days, uh, the U.S. did not pay too much attention to it. In part because China was weak, in part because China, China, the Chinese government deliberately uh, uh, made an effort not to let ideology define China's foreign relations. In other words, to uh, downplay the role of ideology. During Deng Xiaoping's time, he, he specifically instructed to the Chinese diplomats not to play off the ideological issue in China's uh, foreign relations. But now the situation is different. China is no longer that weak. And also, China is no longer uh, made a lot of efforts to refrain from talking ideologically. But of course, the US uh, is worried about uh, China's rise, but at the same time, practicing a different ideology and, 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 and the values. Uh, many people in the US uh, used to support the policy of engagement. And they were hoping that through engagement, China would, would, would like or would become more like the US than uh, before. And for the better part of the, of the past four decades, since China's adoption of uh, the policy of reforms and openness, this turned out to be true. Chinese, uh, China became more developed. China, you know, Chinese became more prosperous. Uh, China began to subscribe to uh, the market system. China began to talk about rule of law and even democracy. China came up with, the uh, Chinese government came up with this uh, 24 character uh, core values, like five, you know, uh, 10 years ago. And these core values include such values as democracy, freedom, Justice, rule of law. You know, just like the uh, what the Americans uh, cherish. Uh, but the problem is, uh, uh, in recent years, those Americans who supported the engagement became disappointed and frustrated, and and probably increasingly concerned about uh, uh, about the trend of development. Instead of uh, a, a China becoming uh, uh, like more, more like the US, they saw China, they have seen China becoming more different <laughs> from the US. So many previous engagement people uh, decided that their policy uh, preference fail. Uh, and so uh, they begin to distance themselves from the policy of engagement. And uh, some even went a bit, well, have gone a bit further to support the policy of containment, uh, thinking this is another way to push China in, the direct, in, in their desirable action uh, direction. So this is unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> in China too, uh, instead of seeing that this is a sign of uh, alienation of the two countries, 
Um, China, for its own reasons, especially domestic political reasons, try to emphasize on ideology. Uh, try to emphasize that it's it's be it's different from the U.S. Um, so as a result, ideological factor has become so much greater than ever before. Uh, paving way for greater, uh, you know, alienation and 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 even confrontation between the two countries. As I just mentioned, I, I just mentioned you know, uh, when you when ideology becomes ideological difference becomes the issue, <laughs> then you know. You have a lot, uh, the problem becomes more difficult to resolve. Uh, like black and white identity politics, you know, uh, the compromise becomes much more difficult. Uh, the reason that I think of Donald Trump is that it, it was very different. <laughs> It's very different president. Uh, before Trump came into office, uh, you know, U.S. presidents have also had problems with China. <laughs> they also want to put pressure on China on this issue or that issue. But there was a limit to it. The limit was to what extent it would damage the U.S. interest, it would harm the U.S. interest. If if the amount of punishment you give to China <laughs> exceeds the amount of damage you create, you you inflict to yourself, you'll be very careful about it. Right. So there were this kind of limits uh, to uh, U.S. actions, U.S. pressures against China. But Trump came in, he thought all other presidents were stupid, <laughs> were not uh, brave enough, uh, bold enough in taking actions. So he did, uh, uh, to, uh, in terms of uh, uh, trade, uh, well, uh, trade uh, tariffs. The amount of trade trade tariffs he uh, imposed exceeded uh, the the imagination of U.S. policymakers of the past, and he didn't care. Of course, it inflicted damage to China, but at the same time, it also inflicted a lot of damage to the U.S. and it violated. International law, like WTO rules. He didn't care. But the way he, 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 he acted um, touched the flaw of the relationship. Basically, the relationship sank through the flaw to such an extent. That cannot it cannot cannot be repaired uh, easily, at least in the short run. So after this bold step was taken, China's U.S. relationship went to the point of no return. And you can take whatever uh, actions. Uh, that previously regarded as uh, as uh, limits. The Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan exceeded a lot of people's expectations because, in theory, it could touch off a wall between in the Taiwan Strait. So this is uh, something that Trump has contributed to the, 
relationship. And the fourth factor is domestic politics between the two countries. In the US, uh, the domestic politics to some extent has prevented the Biden administration to prevent to repair the relationship. When Biden came in, everybody was thinking that he would do something to amend the relationship. But so far he hasn't done by very much. Why? This has a lot to do with American domestic policy. By the time he came in, the Congress was very anti-China. It's interesting that uh, the Congress is divided on anything, everything, right? Very divided. They can't agree on anything. But they can only, but there is one exception that is China. Okay, to get top with China, it's so popular. You know the China-related bills get passed ninety some percent, even unanimous vote. Can you imagine the U.S. Congress passing a bill hundred percent? Oh. Unanimously, <laughs> one American professor joked to me, he said, we, the Congress uh, would have difficulty of passing a, a harmless, you know, bill like uh, making uh, someday as a Mother's Day. <laughs> but then they find, they, they found it, uh, you know, necessary to pass the bill as long as it is part of China. It's amazing. Uh, they have passed quite a few legislations on China, uh, especially over the Taiwan issue. Uh, the Taiwan Travel Act, among other things. Now they are talking about the Taiwan Policy Act, uh, which is uh, even tougher on, on China. And they spend a lot of time on, on, on China. Like uh, in Congress, there are dozens of China related bills. A lot of congressmen uh, are working on it. And also, they spend their precious time to go to, to visit Taiwan. Uh, so, this is uh, one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is that the, the Democrats had a very slim margin in Congress. 50 to 50 in, 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 in the Senate and the 10, 10 votes difference in the House. Okay. But these two situations combined make sure, made sure that uh, the Biden will not dare to do anything soft on China. Because uh, in order to do anything at home, like rescuing the economy, and uh, fighting against the COVID or infrastructure bill, you need the Congress uh, to vote for, for it. But then you can't alienate the Congress people uh, by being soft on China. So that to some extent explains why, uh, you know, the Biden administration has not taken any, has not made any significant attempt uh, to rest to repair the relationship. And, and they try to be tough on China. And when they are tough on China, the Chinese government felt they had to fight back for its own domestic political reasons. And President Xi probably felt that uh, he had to show uh, his uh, political thoughts against uh, the U.S. pressures. Otherwise, the U.S. would find ways to, to work around him and try to interfere in Chinese domestic policies. And the U.S., of course, in order to demonstrate its uh, political correctness, has been criticized China on a whole range of issues. 
So uh, on the Chinese side, uh, we have to be, at least the leaders believe that we have to be very tough. We have to dare to struggle against the US. And finally, the negative interactions is uh, another factor. Uh, and uh, of course, it's closely related to uh, domestic pol political situation. The diplomats of the two countries are no longer diplomatic. Okay. They curse each other in public, <laughs> using coarse language. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, how can you improve relationship if they if, 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 they, if diplomacy uh, doesn't uh, function anymore, okay? They don't see each other. They use very tough language uh, in, in, uh, in, in referring to each other in public. Remember the, the, uh, the meeting uh, at Anchorage uh, in Alaska between the two the senior diplomats of the two countries? The Secretary of State, uh, the, the National Security Advisor, and on the Chinese side, we have Yang, Chairman Yang, and, and also the Foreign Minister Wang Yi. They literally lecture each other in public, in public. And they did it for domestic political consumption rather than to for, for communication. <laughs> uh, such kind of interaction, you know, uh, it's uh, it happens at different levels uh, of the bureaucracy. So as a result, we don't get very much done to manage our relationship. Okay, what about the future? Uh, I think the future does not look well very well <laughs> because all the five factors I just mentioned. <laughs> That I explain explained uh, that uh, are useful to explain the the negative development will continue to to uh, stay. You know, speaking with the Lucidity's perspective, it's like it's continuing. Uh, as China rises further, you know, things may get even worse. Also, uh, in the second place, the ideological, the difference in ideology and political system is likely to play a larger role in shaping the relationship. Both Biden and Xi have their own reasons to emphasize the difference. Um, we are seeing it uh, in the rhetoric of both, of both leaders. In the third place, even though the Trump administration is no longer in the White House, the top approach or China, he inherited, has become some kind of a political correctness in Washington. China has to take the top position as well. And also the popular support for, for the relationship has deteriorated over, over the time in, the, in this kind of contest. According to recent polls, people who favor, who have a favorable view of, of the other country have declined both countries in a drastic way in recent years. In the fourth place, domestic politics of all countries is likely to shape the relationship in a more negative way. Um, I don't know for different reasons. Um, they they can they they see themselves uh, uh, unable to afford to be friendly to each other. And finally, the negative interactions are also difficult to to, to change given the part of the domestic political environment. In the light of all this, I think there is not much hope uh, to respect the improvement of relationships in the short run. 
the relationship is likely to get worse and getting better uh, in the foreseeable future. What the two countries need badly to do now is to make sure that they don't find a war by accident, uh, especially in the Taiwan Strait. Recently, um, Kevin McCarthy, who just became the Speaker of the House, uh, is going to uh, announce that he's going to uh, visit Taiwan again. So uh, they're going to see something uh, very drastic <laughs> over his visit if he does so. In the long run, however, I think one should not need to be too pessimistic. Why? Because the two countries are stakeholders of the existing international system. Uh, they all want political stability. Uh, they all want stability and prosperity of the uh, of the world, and this is the in their best interest. And they all have the need to face the global governance challenges because it hurts both if they are not managed well. So and and, and of course. Uh, they cannot afford to confront each other all up in an all out way because they are what or both nuclear weapon states. So as long as they are not crazy, they have to and will find a way to coexist peacefully and cooperate on issues where they have shared interests. It's our hope that this day comes sooner than later. I don't know when that will happen, <laughs> but I uh, hope it's better than not. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me stop here. Very interesting. And I'm uh, Holly Smith with Emory. I just want to introduce our guest uh, panelists here who found their way into this wonderful chemistry building. Uh, and I want to invite you to come up here if you want, and uh, but to make comments. Um, sorry, we don't have a stage. <laughs> but, uh, uh, this is our stage. I want to introduce uh, Maria Rapazova, who I just saw in September over in England at a conference. And uh, she's a professor of global communication at uh, Georgia State University, and also uh, Professor Wang, Fei Wang, who's uh, at Sandown School of International Affairs, who uh, has long uh, been a known entity and even knows the campus well, right? <laughs> so. Why don't we start with uh, the two of you making comments or raising questions, okay? Would you like to sit down with your office here? Your voice is in here. Your opinion. Yeah, we start. Your voice is in here. Your voice is in here. Yeah. Very Chinese way. Your voice is in here. I go up All right. Yeah. Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Yowie, for organizing this. And welcome, Chen Guo. I haven't seen you in prison for many years. Like 10 years. <laughs> Last time must be a Shanghai Expo, right? Right. right. You sort of bumped into Shanghai Expo, right? Wow. 14 years ago. Um, all right, so um, my task by Yahweh is to, uh, to share with you guys what I think about the U.S.-China relations and the same way I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just very quickly um, make a few observations and assertions, um, not quite, not that different from uh, Qingbo's observations, and then maybe uh, raise a couple of questions for Qingbo to answer. Uh, of course, all the left and the important stuff is going to take care of Maria. Right? <laughs> uh, the first observation I'm going to make is actually I'm of the opinion I share with Chin was a basic premise. I, I'm of the opinion that there are really no fundamental uh, conflict of interests between Chinese people and American people, uh, between the Chinese nation and American nation. Uh, in fact, I think that two countries are fully capable of making the US China relationship a highly mutually beneficial relationship. As the history of the relationship for over 200 years have clearly shown, right? For most part of 200 years, the relationship between US and China has been mutually beneficial, highly complementary and supplementary. You know, what we have, they don't have. What they have, we don't have. They have a kind of very good relationship. And China and the United States has been very late in each other. And America has been instrumental to China as a modern nation. It's formation, it's survival, it's development, you name it, right? 
And China, of course, also contributes to the United States in a great deal, including, you know, cheap labor like me, you know, coming here to work. So in, in a way, this is a, is a first point I want to share with you. In other words, that's, that's not, it's not lose the big picture. The second point I want to share with you, however, is that I also have to believe that in terms of how the two nations organize their own people, and how two nations define state market visions, define uh, state uh, society relationship, and how two nations view the right world order. In other words, for political elites and leaders of different countries, how the world should be organized, should be ordered. Uh, unfortunately, there are some fundamental incompatibilities. Uh, this just facing between PRC and the <laughs> <laughs> or between PRC and the West in general. Right? They just disagree on many, many important things. This is not something of, international, of a national interest conflict, or people don't like people, American people don't like Chinese people, or vice versa. This is a matter of how the two peoples are organized, educated, or indoctrinated, if you will, different. And that created a problem. Uh, ideologically, Politically or worldview. You know, how would you organize basically? Very fundamental. So, that is a uh, second point of initiative. So, so, because of that, uh, the problems have always been there since 1949. Uh, even during the 30 years of engagement between two countries, the problem didn't disappear. It was hidden or assumed away or wished away. Like, oh, it doesn't exist, right? Or was hoped away, like, oh, well, since we change, we will converge, right? In many ways, that converge, convergence did happen. Uh, as you all know, if I've been to China lately, we watch China attentively, you all know China has been changing greatly because of engagement, that to a great extent, also because of the Chinese uh, conscious uh, action, right? Choice. Deng Xiaoping opened China, opened China, reformed China, that's starting the trend. Today, China is unrecognizable to Mao Zedong 30 and 40 years ago. Just simple as that. It's heavily westernized for, for, for good or bad, right? In many, many ways, uh, in terms of living standard, lifestyle, aspirations, infrastructure, technology, right? So, yes, convergence seems to be taking place, but still, the incompatible institutional, ideological, and worldview differences are still there. Now, now, given that, right, uh, this, the third thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, the differences themselves, though, in a, in a way, are not necessarily bad, right? In other words, how we should organize humanity, how we should organize ourselves, how we should handle money, uh, making money, business, the economy, so on, and it's not necessarily bad. We should allow human humanity to have competition, different conditions, different modes, right? Different ways of life. Why? Why not? Chinese way, American way, we're different, right? We're organized differently. We could coexist, as uh, Ching mentioned a number of times, people coexistence. But between the two ways of organizing everything, especially between two ways of organizing the whole world, uh, a critical question is which one may be more preferable? Which one may be more desirable, right? It's not feasibility issue because even a less uh, desirable or inferior system can exist for eons. We all know that, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect system to survive. That imperfect system are fully capable of surviving for thousands of years, right? So the current question in today in a very globalized world for us to think about is, which one is less uh, undesirable? Which one's more preferable, right? And it is here, as so I have tried in my own work, I'm, I'm doing a little commercial here. Uh, I've got the work of the China Order, and the sequel is coming out very shortly for China Record. But I try to uh, arrive at the sort of a finding that may not be uh, ear pleasing to everybody. That is uh, the Chinese way of organization, uh, you know, how to organize people, how to organize the economy, how to the world. The Chinese way is clearly, clearly feasible, formidable but clearly undesired or less desired for that way compared to existing alternatives, right? So that's the third point I want to share with you. 
And the fourth and final thing that I want to share with you is, well, if, say, a different way of organizing things is not intending to change the existing way of organizing things, that may be more preferable. Uh, I, I guess most people may uh, sort of agree with me. Yeah, it's kind of not too bad to be in the United States, in the West, right? It's not too bad for China to be Westernized. But the premise is somehow this way may be slightly more preferable. If the less preferable one, the inferior one, if you will, right, is relatively weak, right? Sort of following is one issue. But if that one is now become ever more capable, and moreover, because the internal mechanism has to fight to change the whole world, then we're going to have a problem. Right? So therefore, my final point I want to share with you guys before I rest, maybe two questions, which you can think about is that, well, in my humble opinion, between a rising Chinese power, which is fully capable right now, and beside the PRC state, the government is actually world-class power already. If you think, well, Chinese living standards are still low, you know, China is still a second largest economy, it's a developing country, yes, all that. And China is probably less a uh, desirable place to live, and all that may be. But the PRC state now is a fully world-class power by two simple reasons. One, it has a huge economy to extract from. And two, this kind of extraction is highly centralized and unmonitored makes Chairman Xi Jinping much more powerful than President Biden in terms of how much money he has spent in whatever ways you want, right? So this kind of concentration of power organized in a less desirable, more inferior way will pose a question for everybody to think about what's going to be the future. So I uh, somehow agree with uh, Qing Bo somewhat, but I uh, defer in a way that I see in the future uh, for several possibilities. One possibility is Let's fight out, right? See who will win, will win, right? That, of course, is highly undesirable. It's disastrous because it kills many white people, right? And besides, why do we have to kill people in the 21st century in order to, you know, persuade people to change? We don't need to do that. The second option is very simple, too. For the United States to gradually give in, to accept, well, maybe an inferior or unfamiliar way of organization. But still, hey, what the heck? You can take charge. You can run. But you're not set to back down, to give up a little bit, right? To reorganize the world in Marxist terms or socialist terms or Chinese characters term, or as I use my language, the China order terms, right? The traditional Chinese way of organizing Tianxia. Well, you know, who says America is God given the right to rebuild the world? Right? It's no given. So that's possible. Second uh, possibility, right? The third possibility, of course, is what China continue, as what Qing Guo mentioned, that many people hoped to transform, to change, or in my blunt language, to keep westernizing, to keep changing, right? to keep embracing the world, to become um, a new leader, just as good as America, probably better. Right? That's the third possibility. Final possibility is possibility Qing Guo already taught us, that is unfortunately a quite a new world, new Cold War kind of competition, right? Since PRC and USA has never been fully coupled any time at all, the only coupling we had during the engagement era was actually half coupling, half decoupling, mostly on Beijing terms, right? So the new quite a Cold War essentially would be a decoupling this time more on Washington's terms. So that's kind of a four scenarios uh, I see. And if you ask for my personal biased opinion, which one do I prefer? In fact, I think the quasi Cold War or Cold War competition now appears to be the most likely and least undesirable outcome of the war. That's unfortunately the case. So there you go. I share your domestic view about near wrong, right? We seem to be stuck in this kind of situation. All right, so two quick questions. Mm -hmm. I agree with you that, as you uh, wrote uh, not long ago, you argue that uh, it is critical for China to make the United States 
uh, feel secure, uh, more at ease about rising Chinese power. I cannot agree more. I think that's a perfectly a good point to make, right? So my question is, by doing what? How? You know, what does it take for the PRC to persuade the United States or the West in general? Guys, don't go panic. Don't worry. We're not going to change the way we grow. Uh, you know, right? how to do that? Even what is happening, uh, you know, over the past actually, I would say, fifteen years, not just ten years, I'm just thinking, fifteen years. Even what happened just last week when Xi Jinping led the Cuban leader on Tiananmen Square, Solomon declared socialist communism again. Right? We have the future for us. Given all that. So what does it take? How would you manage to convince the Americans? Come on, feel good, feel at ease. Right? The second question is uh, is narrower. Is do you see if there are or do you hear if there are any uh, dissenting voices in China regarding the Chinese foreign policy? Yeah, as you know, in the West and in the United States, uh, we are notorious. Or internal divisions, right? We have internal diversity. We our foreign policy is zigzagging all the time, right? up and down, all kind of stuff. Trump, Biden, Obama, whatever, right? Um, do you see that uh, also in China to some extent, or is Chinese foreign policy entirely a one voice kind of exercise, right? A one person says it, and that's it. Or there are different voices. Uh, different uh, kind of uh, uh, views that may be uh, uh, influential uh, in, in the reality. So there you go. Thank you. Can, can Professor John hold, hold your answer? Yeah. 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 I remind yeah. you later. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're going to get Maria. So thank you so much for the invitation to join my last minute and to provide this interesting um, discussion. So I wanted to um, read the remarks in terms of the, the expectations of the aspirations for the future of US China relations and focus a bit more on the ideological factor. That's something that I've been studying for my research on US China competition for soft power in my recent work. And I also wanted to talk about some other additional factors that may be contributing to the state of US China relations and pose those sort of questions for Professor Ajayi in terms of how he sees those factors or how does he measure or you know, maybe envision them in the larger context of this presentation and his analysis. So first of all, when it comes to pessimism, I guess I also share a similar sentiment that's been expressed in this panel uh, when it comes to the evolution of US-China relations. And the additional kind of forces that, I guess, the fact that they pessimistic is the diminished uh, changes when it comes to media, culture, and educational ties, right? We talk about this a lot also in the Carter Center uh, events, um, the extent to which you know, we used to communicate uh, when it comes to academic exchanges, discussions, conferences, uh, the Fulbright Fellowship, right, and all kinds of different uh, engagements that have now become almost non-existent for different reasons, right? A part of it, of course, is the difficulty of access to China with the zero COVID policy, uh, and part of it is just the nature of the, again, the confrontation that's taking place on multiple levels that makes exchanges very difficult. So I'm very concerned about the future when it comes to the state of the exchanges across other societal layers, not only the high politics, but also universities, um, the media, Right, the youth, how does this end up featuring in, in US China ties? It seems like that's also uh, an outcome of this confrontation is that these ties are becoming very much curtailed. Um, and then shifting towards the ideological factor, I thought it was a really interesting part of the presentation um, when it comes to the nature of the new Cold War and you know the comments uh, made at the beginning about ideological confrontation not quite being in the level of the, the Cold War, right? You made this really interesting comparison. But then towards the middle of your presentation, you talked about how maybe we are starting to shift towards that uh, domain. So I was wondering maybe that uh, whether we could differentiate between the explicit kind of ideological competition between US and China on the global scale versus a more of a bilateral ideological confrontation of the US versus China kind of bilaterally. So when it comes to the global competition, I would still argue that perhaps the US, uh, US and China are not quite competing for different models um, and visions. In my analyses of US uh, and China's conceptions and practices of soul power, for instance, that often invokes values and, and uh, cultural engagements and so forth, I find that China and the U.S. practice something fundamentally different. For example, in the Chinese case, the focus is often on pragmatic approach to soft power. So it's all about material, or a lot of it is about material empowerment, Chinese initiatives. We have all kinds of diplomatic events um, and uh, all sorts of ordeals that also include economic deals, all kinds of agreements to facilitate aid, whether it's you know, material aid between the pandemic or developmental aid as part of BRI initiative. So all kinds of engagements, including Confucius Institutes, 
when you look at the developing world, a lot of them are about jobs as opposed to just culture or ideology, right? I've done this research in Ethiopia and I found that most students and many parts of Africa, including Ethiopia, they study Chinese not because they're, you know, being kind of ideologically brainwashed to, to be um, interested in China model, quote unquote, but mostly because they want to get a job at a Chinese state-owned enterprise that operates in Ethiopia, right? So many, many jobs that actually pay students um, two to three times the rate of the professor rate, right? So the, the professor at the Ethiopian university gets paid uh, two to three times less than a translator who works for a Chinese company. So I think the, the pragmatic approach can actually be quite effective, especially in the global south. There's something uh, to say when it comes to providing something practical and material, as opposed to only focusing on ideals and values, which is what the US has been doing for a very long time, including under the Biden administration, the Democracy Summit, right? All kinds of big meetings that still emphasize kind of the Cold War rhetoric of values, competition for the global order. So we see that maybe the US is invoking this competition frameworks, but, but the China doesn't quite provide a, a, very, a different model, perhaps, but more so giving something very practical and um, experiential, you know, if, until the pandemic started, going to China has been relatively easy. Uh, for the youth and for you know elites from the global south, that's something I've been also researching. Trainings of journalists, trainings of elites in thousands, right? This is really an immense effort to engage with um, communities that are often disengaged with by the West, right? So it's very hard to come to the U.S. as many of you know to study to get a scholarship, but it's very very easy to come to China up until recently again, up until the zero COVID policy, it was really accessible. I think that access has been very influential in boosting China's image in the global south. So I see perhaps that the two are kind of offering something distinct the US focusing more values and ideals and China focusing more on pragmatic appeal when it comes to global competition as opposed to kind of a different model altogether. And then having analyzed many training materials that they also use in engaging with the leads from the global south, I found that a lot of it is about specific success stories or lessons as opposed to again kind of a cohesive model of what China represents. So how to maybe uh, carry out more effective governance uh, progr programs when it comes to uh, poverty relief, right? The officials are taken to various sites, uh, rural villages to see how China has managed its poverty alleviation projects, but not so much to say that, okay, here is a, a whole different model, uh, a China model. What is it exactly? When you ask the Chinese scholars, they would also say that perhaps there isn't a coherent China model in place. So I think that's something that's worth um, distinguishing. And then when you uh, look at the receiving side of this equation, and again, thinking about the global south here, the elites I've interviewed often see the two is complementary, right? The US is offering something, China is offering something. The more players that are coming into the region, the more they are actually willing to engage with them, right? So they, we also have Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia is becoming more active. Russia has also entered the sphere. It's not just the US and China, there are actually more actors. And they're welcome so long as, again, they're bringing something different and it creates more opportunities for bargaining. So I think uh, when, when it comes to the bilateral engagement, I do very much agree that we see a lot more ideological rhetoric of both, of both sides. That's very much uh, worrisome. For example, in the US, uh, the computer institutes have been largely shut down, right? This was one of the major instruments of soft power um, by the Chinese government. We see something like, I think, 18 of them left. Uh, maybe it's uh, something approximate, but it used to be over 100. So we see this massive movement, not only to shut down the institute, but also to investigate Chinese scientists and American scientists who are, attempt to work together, right? There's all kinds of FBI investigations and really a lot of threatening tactics that are being deployed to, um, to uh, monitor and in some ways to curtail this relationship. And I think a lot of it has to do with ideology. So when I give some of these talks or remarks in Washington at think tanks and talk about the differences between China and the US that I just mentioned to you, the, the, uh, the reactions are very negative. So the reaction is that it, as long as they're, they're training some elites, that means brainwashing, right? That means it's an ideological effort to take over the world. So even though we might empirically examine it differently, I think the, the reaction is often very ideological. That there is no way to see it uh, other than the, to the lens of US-China uh, ideological competition. And I think on the Chinese side as well, we see a huge shift at least in, in the media coverage when it comes to, of course, Global Times, but also more you know, official publications that um, tend to invoke a lot more rhetoric and, uh, and uh, articles that are being published very critical of the United States. Uh, and not only about you know, high politics, but also about American society as kind of deteriorating, right? Our democracy is very fragile. Uh, and a lot of the issues they point to are, are legitimate issues. They're not necessarily false or um, irrelevant, they're actually very relevant, but the focus on those very particular kind of fractures or weaknesses of the US political system has become a prominent, I think, uh, feature of um, Chinese media coverage of the United States, which of course contributes to this, again, kind of heating up of the ideological, bilateral ideological uh, kind of ties, which I think is quite a dangerous and um, uh, phenomenon when it comes to the US-China relations. Um, so I wanted to also shift towards um, a couple of other factors beyond you know, ideology. What are some other factors that maybe we can take into account? And I was wondering um, if uh, Professor Tiaxing Wu could, could uh, comment a little bit on um, the, uh, the argument that is often made in the U.S. policy community about the inequity in U.S.-China relations, like the unfairness of these of this relationships. So you mentioned that there's 
this kind of declining, um, you know, uh, attitudes towards China in, in, the, in the high political circles in the United States. But a lot of the arguments that have been made for many, many years is also about a degree of unfairness. So, for example, Chinese media uh, has uh, has had until recently a lot of access to the U.S. you know media market. Uh, Confucius Institutes again until recently have had a lot of access to the U.S. Uh, education system. Um, Chinese companies have also had, again, until Trump era, a lot of access to the U.S. market, but not vice versa, right? For a very long time, for instance, uh, when it comes to carrying out cultural engagements, when it comes to media access, Western media has been practically driven out of China. So um, there's a sense that this kind of, there's something that's unequal, it has to be um, somehow fixed or um, uh, this, it needs to be some kind of remedy. So I'm curious whether you see the sentiment um, analyzed or engaged with on the Chinese side, and if so, in what ways? Another factor that I think is worth noting here is the, the, the in terms of domestic politics, the turn towards more populist uh, and fragmented and very much divisive politics here in the United States, right? So of course, Trump himself is the central figure of that, but arguably he's only a manifestation of larger societal uh, divides, right? Of a larger polarization of society. So is Trump really the sole factor or is it more about the US society becoming very, very divided? Even in the current election, election cycle here in Georgia, right? We have this really divisive election. Uh, and it's surprising to what extent, uh, you know, some support, some, some of the political uh, leaders that are running for office, right? So is there kind of a, uh, is this a contributing factor as well, this kind of political division, polarization in the United States when it comes to the US China policy. And when it comes to China, the zero COVID policy, right? Uh, the constraints on movement that right now we're seeing uh, some protests springing up across Chinese cities uh, in the recent days, uh, highly monitored by you know, social media activists and the media uh, at large in the West. Um, to what extent is this also a reflection of frictions happening within China? And how do those kind of frictions and fragmentations affect US China relations on both sides? Um, and then uh, the other uh, couple of factors I want to mention is uh, the kind of diplomatic turn towards the Wolf Warrior diplomacy style, right? In the case of China, uh, the more assertive diplomatic engagement. Um, you mentioned how the Chinese government has to respond to the US, like they have to kind of react, right? So the idea is sort of self defense. Uh, but could you also argue that the overall style of China's diplomacy has transformed, not only vis a vis the US, but also the West at large, uh, towards a more boisterous, perhaps more assertive, more confident uh, narrative? And if so, is that really just a reaction to Trump? Or is this kind of a lower, longer again dissatisfaction with China not having the right uh, the, the the right kind of uh, space for its sort of discourse power? Like why is China the idea of having a a space to express itself in the international system? Um, so that's that's the other question I had in terms of the additional factors. Um, and uh, the last point I wanted to make is in terms of kind of expanding U.S.-China relations uh, again into the global context. And I was curious if you could comment a little bit on how China-Russia relationship, you know, in, in light of this current war in Ukraine, uh, how does this potentially affect U.S.-China uh, relations? Is this an important factor? Um, are you kind of skeptical of the the nature of U.S.-China-Russia ties being portrayed as you know very much kind of merging and um, and uh, or converging, colluding, or or do you see that as being the case? And what about uh, the state of US-EU relations and how you know, US has become closer to, to Europe under Biden? Does that also affect uh, China-US relations uh, as well? And finally, on a more hopeful note, how do you envision the role of kind of more globally oriented youth, right? We see this uh, the youth in both countries as exposed to all kinds of, um, again, global media culture, perhaps it's westernized, but also they're somehow still communicating with one another. Do you see this as maybe as some sort of little slimmer of hope when it comes to US-China relations? So I'll stop there and I'm really excited to hear your, uh, your responses. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. in just uh, one more comment because I was, I just can't as a moderator. <laughs> you know, I think one thing we have just avoided talking about is what I would call the elephant in the room. And the uh, metaphor is useful because an elephant is also the symbol of the Republican Party. And um, it's never before in history. I mean, to say that Trump, you know, it's changed completely. I mean, Trump was not a long-standing Republican Party member. Trump was a Democrat previously. Okay. Trump, but what Trump has always been is a puppet, so to speak, of one country. And that country is the one that um, we haven't talked about, and that is Russia. And so we don't, we are the only, this is the only time in American history where we have one political party literally paid for by one foreign country called Russia. It's, how is it done? It is done through the National Rifle Association's money that comes through. It's done through our campaign finance laws that allows no disclosure on where money is coming in. And the only thing that's slowing that down are the sanctions against the oligarchs and the and you know the war that has that Biden has put into place. But it doesn't really it hasn't really you know mattered. So when I say that, I own that because it's not as if Trump is was the Republican Party, right? <laughs> it's as if Trump is Trump and Trump has his own interests to protect 
businesses that might be based on loans that are guaranteed through uh, Russian behind a Deutsche Bank source of loan, right? So we have that has all, there's just wide open problems of <laughs> of that happening, and so to the extent that that has an effect, I mean, on what's going on in the United States, I don't think we can talk about. U.S. public opinion without talking about how much Russia has been interfering in brainwashing <laughs> through through online sources that I'm studying. I study social media now, and um, for for over a decade. I mean, for you know, QAnon has a long history, and QAnon once you're vulnerable and in there, you can be fed just about anything. And so I just wanted to throw that. <laughs> so we have to remember that about the United States. But please, Professor. Well, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, so many exciting questions. Uh, very difficult to answer. Uh, um, let, let me uh, try to address a few. Uh, first is, uh, uh, you know, Katie, you raised a very good question. That is uh, how China can assure the U.S. <laughs> how can you assure the U.S.? It's almost impossible, right? Uh, the U.S. is... Uh, uh, is uh, not just one actor, it's many actors. Uh, they have very different maps, <laughs> so very difficult to assure the US. Uh, but you have to uh, somehow uh, to assure the US. Uh, so for your own good, uh, uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, China is uh, in the process of transition and development. Uh, I argue in various places that China is a country, uh, is a rising, uh, uh, in the process of rising, it's not risen yet. It's different. It's already different from uh, before rise. <laughs> so it's a country that has dual identities and interests. It's a developing country and a developed one. It's a rich country and poor one at the same time. And identity defines interests, then China has a lot of conflicting interests at the same time. That explains why China, uh, you know, in uh, conducting foreign, po uh, foreign policy has, uh, uh, has been increasingly uh, self contradictory. <laughs> For example, um, climate change. You know, uh, I remember when. Uh, Premier Wen Jiabao uh, led the Chinese delegation to attend the Copenhagen summit. Many people were disappointed that because he, he was there to defend China's interests as a developing country, to defend the right to development rather than to, uh, to uh, deal with, uh, address the issue of uh, climate change. But before he went there, and after he, he came, came back to China, he devoted a lot of time and energy to promote the cutting emission. <coughs> Why the contradictory behavior? Because whatever he does is right. You know, he, when he tries to defend China's interests as a developing country, Refusing to sign any commit uh, any uh, you know agreement that uh, that uh, that, uh, that would uh, you know bind China, uh, he was he was defending a country, the developing country. But when he came back to China, he was defending a country, uh, China that's developed. If you go to China, you'll find that China is both a developing country and a developed country at the same time. You go to Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangdong, then you'll find a developed country. Developed country. We have better, you know, high-speed rails. <laughs> we can say that now. Uh, but if you go to the countryside, China is still a developed country. So, this is a particularly great and difficult time for China to, to conduct co coherent foreign policy. Uh, and uh, to assure the US, uh, China has to make 
China has has to make double efforts <laughs> to make sure that the U.S. do not get the wrong message. It's very interesting that the President Xi, in his meeting with uh, President Biden, he told him that uh, China is not uh, going to challenge the U.S. leadership. Doctor, let me ask you a question as you approach that subject. As a student of China, it just seems to me that everything we hear from diplomats and military people is always confrontational in these last few years. We've got better weapons. We're going to control space. We're going to go up to the polar cap and claim in. It's all confrontational. So what are we supposed to think? And you look at the development of the South China Sea and what was built there. That's not Club Med. That's military. That's military. And then all the provocations that you see of uh, incursions into the ADIS to different air spaces, it's always confrontational. So what are we to think? Uh. Yeah, um, that's another uh, challenge uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, assuring the US. <laughs> Very difficult. As China grows uh, stronger, uh, Chinese people put a lot of pressure on the Chinese government. Uh, you know, on the South China Sea, China has made claims many, many years ago. That's the claims have not changed. But China did not do very much in the old days. Why? The Chinese government told the Chinese people that, look, we are not that strong. We cannot do anything about it. <laughs> and then Chinese neighbors like Vietnam and other countries try to, uh, you know, uh, assert their sovereignty over uh, by taking actions. And then the Chinese government said, no, we are not strong enough. We are not going to do, do anything about it. We cannot do anything about it. And now the Chinese people are saying, no, you are not strong. You, 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 you are not that weak anymore. Why don't you do something about it? Is um, it the so this is the, or CC this is the pressure. No, 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 the Chinese people. I, I, I'm condemned many times by the Chinese people <laughs> for being too soft. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but, but, but anyway, well, on the internet, on uh, social media, places, okay. social media. But but anyway, I, I would say that uh, this is a this is a one one problem China is facing. Uh, you want to assure the U.S., but then uh, you know you are facing a, a population that that wants you to do something to defend the so-called legitimate right the interests of China. <clears throat> but in the U.S., of course, you perceive this as uh, some kind of a expensive, uh, aggressive kind of act. In, fact, in other words, uh, China has been in, in imposing new claims and, and expand on the you know, geopolitical terms. That's not true. China's claims have been there for many years. But the problem is uh, uh, the difference is that China has made greater efforts to assert those claims. I don't know it's, whether it's a good idea to assert the claims in that way, but I would say this is part of the logic of the, of, of the current conflict. Uh, it's difficult, part of the difficulty of the Chinese government to assure, to assure, to reassure the U.S. that the rise of China is not close to uh, a plan. But the problem is that uh, we also have people in China who argue that, you know, uh, look, uh, the U.S. has been conducting military activities along China's coast. Consistently for many, many years, okay, doing the reconnaissance activities along the Chinese coast. Even though in the high seas, the uh, Americans believe that this, they have a right because uh, you have freedom of navigation in the high seas. But the Chinese interpretation of freedom of navigation in the high seas that, is that if you travel too close to our coast, even though you are in the high seas, uh, you have to, uh, uh, to to let us know and, and uh, uh, you know uh, to 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 conduct in a in a way that is prudent. Uh, but the problem is, uh, you know, we have a difference over this issue. Uh, in the past, China could not do very much about it. Now, China is doing much more 
uh, to interfere to uh, to to make uh, to to uh, somehow create troubles <laughs> for the for the American uh, airplanes and and uh, military uh, warships uh, along China's coast, uh, and then this ha has become another uh, source of friction. Uh, I don't know who is right, who is wrong. Okay, maybe I've been arguing to to the PLA. I said, look, maybe we should not protest too much on this because one day we'll be like the U.S. We, we want to patrol in other countries, uh, the near other countries' coast <laughs> to collect information, <laughs> intelligence, uh, so that we can uh, play our role as the so called, uh, uh, you know, peacekeeper. order peacekeeper, yeah, <laughs> order keeper or peacekeeper. So we don't want to uh, find away our future interests. <laughs> but anyway, this is uh, something, you know, China is this rising. And we are facing a lot of problems associated with rising. And part of this has to do with uh, the issue you raise. Uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, we don't see reciprocal arrangements in terms of access uh, by our diplomats, by journalists, by other people. Okay. Why? Because China was a very weak country uh, in the past. Okay. And China demanded have this kind of an equal arrangement for fear of uh, interference of uh, your own internal affairs. As a weaker party, you care more about sovereignty, control, and that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, but China has risen, has become strong, but Chinese mentality has not kept up with it. We are still used to the old way of an uh, equal <laughs> arrangement. <laughs> That kind of unequal re re arrangement uh, reflects on the power asymmetry of the past. But now China is no longer that weak, but this old uh, arrangement uh, continues. And that caused increasing dissatisfaction on the part of the developed countries. They are saying, look, how, how come you still want to keep this unequal arrangement? Okay. But it's ironic that it's the Chinese who are demanding equality and respect, <laughs> mutual respect. <laughs> so this is a, a very interesting stage associated with this period of uh, development. That is China in transition, okay? uh, where China, Chinese material communities may reach a certain stage, but the psychology, mentality is still uh, associated, still stuck with the past you know, to some extent. So I've been arguing in China. I said, look, we have to adapt to the realities. We are not that weak anymore. Uh, let's face it. Okay? Others are not going to accept this kind of arrangement. We should have equal access. Okay? Sooner or later, we have to change. It's uh, better for us to change earlier than later, right? Uh, uh, otherwise, we'll become, you know, uh, 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 we, we would be put in a sort of a even more disadvantageous state. Okay. And finally, uh, and, and the, another question is policy uh, uh, differences in race. Yeah. Um, of course, we have policy differences. <laughs> you, you, you may have, uh, you know, the, you identify with the same goal of, of the party of the nation, but still you have a lot of uh, differences in terms of how to attain those goals. Okay? We have a lot of policy differences. <laughs> some people think we should do, do it this way. Some people think we should do it that way, just like in the U.S. Okay? Uh, in the U.S., you even defer on the uh, on the policy goal, uh, uh, national goal, uh, 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 in general, in public, uh, in China, we don't we don't uh, uh, contest on, on at that level, but we we do fight <laughs> over uh, how how to uh, attain certain things. But of course, uh, we also deliberate on uh, uh, larger issues, uh, but mostly private. Um, there are many other questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> war and diplomacy. Uh, I think it's unfortunate to hear the 
that the you know that that was a a, a phase in which uh, for all kinds of reasons uh, uh, we 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 saw the diplomats suddenly uh, took stance on issues that um, were considered as undiplomatic. Uh, many factors contributing to this. Uh, the, the foreign factor that is uh, uh, the perceived foreign factor that is uh, uh, the Western countries, especially the US, try to demonize China, uh, politicize China's efforts uh, to fight the virus, uh, to fight the pandemic. Now, basically, China was very successful actually by any standards in the early stage of the of containing the virus. Uh, within a very short period of time, China contained the, uh, the, the, the pandemic. Uh, and very by by conventional standards, very few people die. Okay. Uh, it was a stunning success, especially in the light of the fact that the virus was something unknown and uh, nobody else have practiced the, the, the have, have, uh, have done it uh, before China. Uh, so China was very successful. But then Chinese efforts were, 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 were dis uh, described in a way uh, as if China had, uh, had made a huge mistake, uh, you know, uh, committed the Chinese government committed a huge crime, and that's all they. So this made the Chinese government extremely angry, uh, very upset. And that's part of the story. Okay? Uh, even when China tried to help others, including the US, in terms of supplying the medical su you know, supplies uh, to help, the, you know, China and other countries, uh, these efforts were, were, were uh, described in a way as if China was was purely uh, that was doing this purely for propaganda cases. Of course, there is propaganda. I mean, when the US try to help others, there is propaganda by default. But the problem is, uh, you know, when, when it's, it was described as purely an propaganda effort, that made a lot of Chinese very angry, upset. So we and and also it, it it happened at a time when China Chinese government was trying to emphasize on political correctness <laughs> uh, in China. Uh, so somehow you have to take a you know strong stand against perceived evil, <laughs> and the West was perceived protected in that way. So the diplomats had to take principled positions. So it was a very unfortunate time that we had. Uh, but there were good reasons for that to happen. Uh, I hope in the future we are, we are, we are, we, are, we, we, we do more diplomacy you know, rather <laughs> than you know uh, bashing each other. Uh, uh, so uh, so if you look at the 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 the, the, the rhetoric of the Chinese diplomats today, very different. Let me, let me stop here. Maybe we have some other questions. Yes, are there other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hello, Professor Chia. Uh, I'm a sort of studying political science, and I think I've read some articles about uh, sort of this trap before about uh, from Professor Chen Chen Dan from Fudan University. He talked about like uh, he said that the sort of the sort of this trap is actually a kind of design by the West because like the trap means that it is the rising power that sets up the trap to the existing strong power. Besides this, also we can see that like the, the consequence may not lead directly to war as the Cold War of USSR and US is not like something related to the Cold War. Like so basically, to what extent do you think that this model, like the associated trap, can be applied to the current US China relationship? Well, I know uh, Professor uh, Alice. I don't think he had a grand scheme <laughs> of, 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 of conspiracy. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think he, he, he tried to uh, warn us the possibility that the rising power and the established power may not get along and may, may get into uh, a war. And he, he, he conducted his project uh, trying to uh, examine all the cases of the rising powers and how they uh, dealt, you know, they end up with the uh, given in their relationship with the established power. And he found that in most cases, uh, the rising power and the established power had a war. Okay. And, and, and then he, he said, this is a, a real possibility for rising power and established power to fight a war. So uh, he came up with this concept, the, the city's strategy to warn people uh, especially Chinese and Americans to uh, be aware of this fact and try to avoid this kind of disaster from happening. Uh, this kind of disaster, I don't think he deliberately tried to track uh, the two countries uh, into this kind of a uh, situation. Uh, but having said this, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the argument that uh, the rising power and the established power the, uh, are very likely to get into a military conflict may not be true. Okay. Uh, I don't think uh, he's, uh, I mean, his project is uh, convincing or persuasive enough uh, for me. <laughs> because if you look at, uh, uh, there, are, there are many, uh, uh, you know, uh, many things he could not explain. One is uh, the rise of the U.S. Why it was peaceful. You know, the U.S. became the number one power of the uh, of the world uh, in 1890, uh, when its economy exceeded that of the of Great Britain, and then it became the power uh, that's larger than. And of course, GDP that was larger than Germany and Britain combined on the eve of the World War One. Why, why the British had no? Why didn't the British have, have any uh, plan to contain uh, the U.S.? <laughs> uh, why the U.S. and Britain did not fight a war? Uh, I mean, you cannot explain that. And also, why Germany, the third. You know, the, the, the third largest economy did not cover all for this war with the second largest economy, Britain. Okay. Uh, so, um, and also, um, how do you explain the rise, uh, the peaceful rise of Germany and, uh, and Japan after the World War? Uh, and the US did not have any war plans against these two countries, uh, despite their rewrites. Uh, and also China's uh, peaceful rise so far. Uh, if you follow the the Lusini draft uh, logic, uh, they should have fought uh, all these cases. In all these cases, they you know uh, we should have wars, but not but none of this uh, none of these cases ended up uh, uh, in war. Okay. Uh, so I, I would say that this argument, uh, this uh, theory is. It's quite flawed, uh, but I think it, he's, it's good. His intention was good. He wanted to warn the, the, the world uh, to, to avoid this kind of disaster. Thank you so much. I think we have to wind it up because we're 15 minutes, we're running over, but I just want to give us uh, one more insight from social media since we're all living through. Is anybody here on Twitter? Yeah. Yes, we're all watching the you know, Twitter, where is it going, right? <laughs> China has a big advantage. I mean, Weibo, but which I've studied, is, you know, I mean, you could say it's helping to guide public, right? I mean, through the government actors on Weibo, let's say, we, Russia's in, in Twitter. <laughs> so I don't have, so the, the, the point of all this is, don't take anything personally. I'm so no. yeah. <laughs> China should not, because, the, the goal here is to sow discord in the United States, 
make it extremely unstable. And it's been, you know, it's not over yet. We're once this election is over, then it will become another period of instability after January 6th. So <laughs> you know, I mean, we it's it's I mean, we're going to, you know, we're 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 in, we're in a lot of trouble in the United States. Everybody's got guns or more than one. And they can carry them without a license here in the state of Georgia, according to our thanks for our governor. And they don't even have to be them. And then they can walk around with them. So you know we're we're in a difficult position, and therefore I would call this more of a um an a current moment, which may be taking us down a path of the wrong way for a long time, but it, it shouldn't be seen as an inevitable outcome. You know, the technology has allowed bad actors in the US case, um, and in the Chinese case, it's allowed government public opinion guidance to possibly be operating more effectively. If that could happen in the US, it would be a lot easier, <laughs> but we don't, we can't, we're not guiding public opinion on Twitter. We're just, you know, we're, we're watching uh, party spikes, so to speak. So it, we have, you know, we have quite a difficult um, situation happening right now. But we, you know, just to thank all of you for your fascinating comments and for being here and finding your way all the way to. So thanks to the Department of Political Science, we do have a reception. I thought if you exit this room. Take a right, go all the way down the hall. That's the reception. So yeah. join us and we go with all the sessions over there. So I'll see you on the hall. Bye. 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 Bye.